Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony Painter. I'm Chief Research and Impact Officer here at the RSA. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to today's event. Now, over the last year, government policies in response to the COVID-19 pandemic have reignited the universal basic income debate, something the RSA has had a long-standing interest in. Um, we've been focusing on you know, how uh, universal support can uh, give a vital lifeline um, to uh, families in situations of distress. Now, in the US, Congress has distributed nearly $850 billion through three rounds of stimulus checks. And in the UK, we've had the furlough scheme, an income replacement scheme, wage-related, uh, and a self-employed support scheme. And they've helped millions keep their heads above water. So we've seen firsthand the impact that government-led income support can have. But these measures are temporary and specific and emergency related. So what can we really learn from them about the longer term viability of universal basic um, income? And what can the growing number of pilots exploring basic or guaranteed income uh, teach us? Now, I'm delighted to have the chance today to talk with uh, Michael Tubbs and Natalie Foster. Michael D. Tubbs is the founder and chair of Mayors for Guaranteed Income. He's special advisor to Governor Newsom, um, in California on economic mobility and opportunity. And he's the former mayor of the city of Stockton in California. He's the driving force behind the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration, or SEED, which was a two-year guaranteed income trial um, in Stockton, which concluded in March of this year. So I'm sure we'll touch on that. Um, and Natalie Foster is president and co-founder of the Economic Security Project, which is a network dedicated to advancing a guaranteed income in America. Um, and reigning in the unprecedented con concentration of corporate power. She's a senior fellow at the Aspen Institute uh, um, Future of Work Initiative and former director of uh, Obama's Organising for America, MoveOn.org um, and the Sierra Club. So I couldn't have two better people to explore the issues uh, in this rapidly developing um, debate. Now, I'm going to start off with a, with a question to Michael, if that's that's OK. and and. Um, I, it's a sort of point of definition as much as anything else. Um, but I, I keep on seeing references to guaranteed income as opposed to basic income. Now, there was a, an article earlier on uh, this week in the MIT Technology Review, which basically said UBI is dead, long live guaranteed income, which, if I'm honest, confused me a bit because I've, I've never quite understand the difference between the two. If indeed there is a big difference, and perhaps you could fill us in on, on what that might be. Cool. Absolutely. And thank you so much for, for having me. It's always good to be in conversation with my dear friend, Natalie, who I'm in conversation with almost every day about <laughs> topics um, such as this. And to your point, I think the distinction is, is one that matters, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing in this whole conversation is about how do we get reoccurring ongoing payments to people who need them? And the difference between a guaranteed income and a universal basic income is that all all universal basic income programs are guaranteed income programs, but all guaranteed income programs aren't universal basic income programs. And the only difference is that a guaranteed income program is like how you start off with what with what the president has proposed with the child tax credit, for example, that it goes to a defined number of people. So in the in the American context, it was to people who made 75K or below um, during the pandemic in terms of one-time stimulus checks. Now, if those were reoccurring, that would be a form of, of, of guaranteed income. So, so that's the major difference. I think for me, it's the difference between helping 90% of people, including 100% of people who absolutely need some sort of cash um, to build an income floor and, and provide a universal benefit to everyone. And that's really, that's really useful. I've, I've often thought that there are some sort of purists in the discussion that are like, here's a definition of base, universal basic income, and it has to be exactly like this or it can't be countenance. So I've, I've always thought that was slightly counterproductive because actually in many ways, it's a, it's a sort of ideal type. And are we moving towards something which is more universal and guaranteed? That seems to me to be the, the critical question. I don't know whether you agree, Natalie. Yeah, I think that's right. To me, the big idea here is the guarantee. The guarantee is what challenges neoliberal capitalism that has left so many people behind <clears throat> over the last 50 years. And it says, no matter what, you are guaranteed this income each month 
that you can count on with no strings attached and that targeting it to families who need it is perhaps good policy at a moment when there's so much work that needs to be done um, in, in the United States and, and more broadly. Um, cash is a part of a new social contract, but, but not, the, not the ending place, just the beginning place. Don't let perfection be the enemy of the, of the good. Um, in, in other words, perhaps. I think that, that, that's got a lot of sense, sense to it. Michael, tell us a bit about Seed. Um, and we'll, we'll keep on touching this during the co- on this during the course of the conversation. But what, what is it that was, that, that was done through Seed? And what did you find out? And, you know, what have been some of the impacts? Yeah, absolutely. And Seed actually formulated, and again, a Natalie and Michael Tubbs conversation. We were at um, a, a Tech for America conference or something like that. And she mentioned how the Economic Security Project was thinking about working on piloting a universal basic income um, in the city. And serendipitously, literally the week before, two weeks before, my team had begun writing me proposals about how can we use cannabis revenues and other things to provide some sort of basic income to folks in Stockton. So we decided to work together and, and, and that's sort of the genesis of Seed. And what Seed was, was a originally 18 months, we extended it to 24 months because of the pandemic, um, basic income demonstration where we weren't able to get to everybody, but we did create a representative sample of the, po- of the, ci- of the city with 125 residents um, from throughout the city who are given $500 a month on debit cards for two years. There was no strings attached to it. There was no, they didn't have to participate in the study if they didn't want to. There was like literally no requirements um, to really test and see and really put to bed these antiquated notions that A, we can we can only trust some people with money, but we can't trust those who are struggling with money. Um, B, like what, how is money actually spent? What do people need money on? And, and, and C, can we really, is, is any government entity, any government official smart enough to think about all the ways in which your constituents need to use money on a day-to-day basis. How did it go? I think it went smashing well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, we did the evaluation um, with our friends at the University of Pennsylvania, and they found, they tested really three things, A, impact on income volatility or, the, or sort of the income fluctuations that folks have, um, two, kind of impacts on mental health and wellness, um, three, sort of how the money w- was spent and four labor impacts. And let me start with the labor impacts because that's the one everyone has questions about. So survey says, data says, research says that those receiving a guaranteed income were two times more likely to be employed than those who didn't receive a guaranteed income. I'm gonna say that again. Those who received a $500 at the end of two years were two times more likely to be in employment than those who did not receive the $500. And they were significantly more likely to transition from part-time jobs to full-time jobs than those who didn't receive a guaranteed income. And I start there because I think it's important to realize that part of the reason why people are looking for work, people are out of work, and people may not be working is because they don't want to work. It's because there's real barriers to employment, at least in the American context. We don't have paid time off, for example. So to take time off to interview for a full-time job means you have to take money out your pocket that's not guaranteed, while your bills are guaranteed. And it's a risk that far too many people, particularly those with kids, just aren't able to take. Or if you need to get your car fixed, or if you need uniforms and clothes, et cetera. And what we saw is that $500 was enough to unlock the economic potential of folks, A, but B, also reward people like women primarily for doing the work at home in terms of caregiving, in terms of not wanting to work a minimum wage job that pays $25,000 a year only to turn around and give that entire check over to childcare to have somebody watch your kid while you do the job, which which actually doesn't make much economic sense. The second thing we found was just impacts on income volatility. We knew that before the pandemic in America, one in two Americans, 50% of the entire United States could not afford one $500 emergency. And we saw that those with a guaranteed income were able to absorb shocks to absorb not just, or be in a better position, not just for COVID, but for like the car tire breaking, for like kids being, for like life, because life happens and life is oftentimes very expensive. And for a lot of people, if you look at some of the data in the States, it's literally $300 that has caused some people to fall into homelessness for years because they could could have $300 one time. So we saw the $500 was able to allow people to build economic resilience and this was all pre-COVID. So I, I'm excited for next year when we release the data during COVID because we'll see 
those who received the guaranteed income versus those who didn't were probably in radically different positions um, during and after the pandemic. And, and the last thing um, we that was measured was impact on health. And we saw that people who received the guaranteed income um, were happier, had more time, had more agency, and they kept saying they could breathe. And in terms of the data on the Kessler scale, those who received the guaranteed income and those who didn't receive the guaranteed income before the trial began, both had elevated levels of stress and anxiety. They would be they'd be diagnosed as depressed on average. After just one year, those who received the guaranteed income had normal le- they were at a normal level on the Kessler scale. They were no longer depressed. They were less anxious. They were able to have agency over their time. I think important for me as a former government official, they were actually able to do the things we want people to do, to be parents, to be good neighbors, and to be better partners. Yeah, Anthony, I'll just jump in and say that is one of the things that struck me uh, watching Mayor M- Michael Tubbs and his team as they were, you know, releasing the research. You know, so many reporters would say, well, what are people spending the money on? And the answers are pretty obvious. You know, people are spending the money on groceries and utilities. They're paying down debt. Um, but the thing that never shows up on the ledger was time. People were buying time with the money. They were stopping a third gig. They were pulling out of a second job and able to use that time to either, like the mayor said, invest in themselves to get a job or to spend time with their family. Uh, You know, there's a story of a recipient, Tomas, who um, early on was able to stop a third gig. Uh, And when he became a recipient of the $500 a month and one Saturday morning took his kids to the swimming pool and realized that they knew how to swim, which he hadn't known because he hadn't been able to spend a leisurely Saturday morning with his kids at the swimming pool prior to that. And so I always was struck by those stories that don't show up on how people spent the money ledger, but show up in the, uh, the, the wellness and the well-being measures that the researchers looked at. And, and too often in all these discussions, I think that that we we, we link to sort of economic or, or fiscal conversation very very quickly, without sort of stopping for any time at all on the on on the well being conversation. And actually, what's interesting about the Stockton um, experiment, albeit in a U.S. context, and I think you've you, you know, you've outlined very 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 clearly how there might be very particular barriers that may not be present in a lot of sort of European countries, for for, for example. But the, the, the health and well-being benefits have been fairly consistent in, in Stockton, in North Carolina, in Manitoba, in Finland, um, and so on. And the absence of, of, of an effect that discourages work, which is interesting. Of course, one of the, that's one of the major criticisms that's leveled. Um, anything that looks like a UBI, that it will, it will discourage work. And I don't know in the wider work of the Economic Security Project, Natalie, whether um, you, you've been able to explore that dimension um, a, a little more widely. Yeah, I mean, all the studies show that people are working, the economy is not. Mm-hmm. People are working, the economy is not. And in the United States, one job, one minimum wage job is not enough to put foods on the table. You cannot make ends meet with a minimum wage job in the United States. So therefore, you have side hustles, you have side gigs, you have, you know, you, you cobble it together. And that's not the future of work we all were fighting for. That's not the best that the richest nation on earth can do. Uh, and so part of this is saying yeah, there, you know, there's an income you can count on. And from there, you can take, you know, a, a job that you want. You can spend a little time to make sure that you are working, you know, how you want to work, uh, which is not often available to low wage workers uh, in America. Michael, do you think the pandemic has sort of changed our understanding of the nature of our work and different types of work that we're all involved in? You know, do we understand our relationship with work in a different way? Do you think collectively we're starting to reevaluate um, uh, how we work and what we expect out of our working lives in relation to economic security or, or indeed well-being? Yeah, Anthony, I sure hope so. I think the last year, two years have really, really put in stark light um, everything Natalie just just mentioned. And I, I think we've really begun to see that since we live in a time of pandemics, where it's not just COVID, it's earthquakes, it's fires, it's, wild, it's, it's all types of disruptions, that we have to attach, some things can't be attached to work because work's not always going to be there. If you have to shelter in place for two weeks because you have COVID, you can't go to work. If your business is shut down, 
because it's a public health hazard, because it's an airborne virus, you can't go to work. So we have, so I think we're beginning to detach something from work, like dignity and really understanding that dignity is not attached to work first. It's actually attached to our humanity. And we have to create a society where humans are treated with dignity inside and outside the workplace, irregardless of the jobs they choose to perform. I think the second sort of detachment is really understanding that we have to make sure that the basics, that the people have the fundamentals, irregardless of whether their place of work is open. And for some people, that sounds utopian. But I think what we saw during COVID-19, it was very dystopian, where you had people who were sick going to work, getting everyone sick because they were scared if they had to shelter in place, that they would be evicted from their homes or they wouldn't eat or they would fall behind their credit scores. So I think really sort of this pandemic has really sharpened our focus on the purpose of work. Like we're not like we're not here to serve work. Work is here to facilitate the things we want to do. Right. And I think for so long, and I'm not to ask for with the um, UK context, but for so long in America, so much of it is like we're literally here just to work and we work all day. We work all night. We don't spend any time with our family and, and kids because we're working. I think COVID-19 really reset that and said, like, wait, what's the purpose of work? Why do we work? And then the last thing I'll say, and I know the Economic Security Project has done a lot of work on this, is really kind of broadening the definition of work and understanding that creating art is work, being a student is work, being an entrepreneur is work, being a caregiver at home is work. And we've seen particularly what I'm proud of this country is in this last stimulus plan, a real emphasis of caregiving as central work, as the infrastructure by which all work is able to happen, which is a fairly basic concept, but very, very, very new, at least in our political lexicon. Natalie, yeah. do, you see, do, do you see a similar thing that, that actually we're seeing that, that there's a widening of the, 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 the understanding or consideration of what the nature of work is, the meaning of work to us? Or do you think we're just going to spring back to, to how we were once it all opens up again and we can forget about it and just tell our grandkids a tale? Yeah, well, the proof will be in the pudding. Right now, under our very feet, there is a narrative shift happening. And for those of us who watch these kinds of things, it's truly profound. And one of it, part of it is saying care is infrastructure. When we think about infrastructure in America, we are quick to pass it. It is, it has a political like go light and it's always, it conjures up guys in hard hats. Um, and it, and it conjures up like union jobs, good jobs. And that is being broadened to to reflect what truly is infrastructure that enables work in America, which includes care, predominantly done by women, predominantly done by women of color. It is a type of work that enables work in the US and it's a profound change that's happening and we will know in the next few months if something is truly shifting that we will that will that will change policy and therefore change this country or or if not it's the same with essential workers in the beginning of the pandemic you know we understood that frontline workers were the backbone of our economy and yet they are the lowest paid jobs the most precarious jobs in the US and here we are still in a fight over you know a wage increase in the United States so i think while there's a great understanding it has to translate into policy for it to mean anything in people's lives you know policy is frozen power and so the question i have right now is 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 do we have enough power to actually move this narrative change uh, to to change people's lives and it plays in different ways doesn't it i mean you you mentioned there natalie essential workers and of course a, a lot of them are very, very low paid, um, sometimes incorrectly called low skilled, but of course they're not, they're very highly skilled, they just happen to be happen to be low paid. But um, some are not necessarily low paid um, as, as, as such, and they might have job security. Um, and, you know, they're, you know, they're, you know, those in the medical profession might have you know, a, a degree of job security, if you like. But it's what comes with that, isn't it? And Michael mentioned earlier on you know, the exposures to risk in, in the workplace. But we've done a lot of research at the RSA on, on the economic security of what we call UK key workers, essential workers. Um, and the other risk that they face is to their mental health and well-being and their ability to support their, 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 their families um, and feel that they're supporting their families during the course of COVID as they have extraordinary pressures in, in, in the workplace to deal with the effects of, of, of the pandemic. And so 
The question is actually things like guaranteed income and universal basic income, whether they can help people recalibrate their lives, even if they're not the very lowest paid. Yeah, I think I think that's that's right. Um, I think that um, that uh, an income floor, you know, helps so many. One of the problems in the United States is that we have traditionally targeted our policies to the poverty level, uh, which in the United States is like twenty two thousand dollars roughly a year. And in California, we understand that it is far more people than that who are unable to make ends meet. In California, we understand that it is, you know, uh, uh, one out of three Californians are struggling to even put food on the table. And yet this week, the governor announced a $75 billion surplus in the state's budget. That is a reflection of this moment we are living in where the, of extreme wealth, people who have done well in this economy have done very well through the pandemic and extreme hardship. If you are not one of those folks, then you are left out to dry. And the $75 billion surplus is because of, you know, all the IPOs in our state. Uh, the incomes uh, have gone up for, you know, the top income earners in the country. And so what the governor is doing is proposing to, to give a stimulus check to families who make under $75,000 in California. That's two out of three Californians to help them make ends meet. And this is the kind of policy we need to see more of. You know, over the course of this last year, people in the US were just subject to political whims. We never knew when a stimulus check was gonna come. There were theatrical showdowns on the floor of the Senate in order to even get a stimulus check in December of last year. That's not the way to get us out of a recession. And that is not the way to support the mental health of people who are barely hanging in there in the midst of a pandemic. So, you know, what we're advocating for regular stimulus checks until the crisis is over and an expansion of um, of the child checks, the, the child allowance that was recently passed uh, and a very temporary version of it in the United States. You know, unlike Europe, we do not have money that goes to parents to help uh, to help them raise their children, to buy diapers, to put food on the table. Um, we don't have that. And so uh, it just passed um, with uh, the first piece of legislation that President Joe Biden passed earlier this year. And I think of it as a guaranteed income for families with children. The the expansion of the child tax credit, which in effect is becoming a child allowance, as you say, for the for, for the majority actually if it was sustained at the sort of levels that 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 president biden has 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 put in place it would be far more generous than available in the uk for example so there's there's a bit of a leapfrog leapfrogging uh, moment go, go, going on michael what how do you see sort of the the, the biden agenda fitting in to all or all, all this because it has touched on some of some of these areas like quite sort of politically and rhetorically embracing the arguments of, of universal universalism underpinning them, or, or have I got that wrong? Yeah, no, I think what we've seen from this administration to Natalie's point is just a huge step forward to where we need to be as a country. Um, and partly was this idea that understanding that Joe Biden is able to govern um, because of we won the Senate race in Georgia. And we won this in the race in Georgia because we talked about checks. We talked about ensuring that folks had what they needed to survive and that they had the agency to make decisions about how to spend their money. And because of that, I think we see it infused throughout sort of his policy proposals. If you look at the childhood tax credit, which I can't talk about enough, it's this notion that uh, every American family with a child should get money for that child just for being parents. And that is a guaranteed income for families with children. It's a huge first step. And, uh, and the fact there's already action from senators that say we want this to be a permanent part of our social contract, I think is significant. Um, but we also see it in this whole conversation Natalie mentioned around care as infrastructure, about honoring care workers, about honoring domestic workers, about honoring the folks who do the work at home. I think by elevating sort of the importance of caregiving and of domestic work, we're also creating a more feminist economy or an economy that values the contributions of women at least as much, if not more than, as they should be the, the contributions of men in terms of, again, providing the infrastructure upon which work, work can happen. So um, I know Natalie and I and our teams have had conversations with senators and also the administration about the need for reoccurring stimulus checks. I, and I think that 
the childhood tax credit is a good first step. It's not the final step, but that it should be reoccurring checks. We are very supportive of the work around automatic stabilizers. Um, so that once sort of a metric, whether it's African-American unemployment goes back to pre-2019 levels or pre-2008 levels, whatever the number, whatever the metric is, but having some sort of stabilizer that tells us we recovered and not some arbitrary, I don't have to wear a mask. That means this, 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 this pandemic is over. But the Biden administration has done a great job thus far. We look forward to, I look forward to continue working with them and pushing them when needed because I'm adamant that we just need a guaranteed income because it just represents to me smart pandemic contingency planning in terms of thinking ahead of what happens in the next pandemic or the pandemic after that because we know they're coming. Michael, one of your one of your tweets caught my attention a few weeks ago. In fact, lots of your tweets catch my, my attention as, as we go on, but but one of them in particular, and because it was it was so relevant to, to to some of the things we were looking at at the time, and you said something along along the lines of human dignity first, then then dignity at work. And you know, you've mentioned it earlier on in 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 our conversation around dignity and work, and there is a, you know, you, I, I think. Gene Sperling has, has has done a book on economic dignity in the, in the US. Um, there's a Labour MP here, John Crudders, um, who has just published a book, Dignity of Labour. In fact, I had him on on this event a couple of weeks ago, and it's 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 really interesting, sort of engaging with their work and and thinking about what 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 they are fearful of actually. And that they're, they're, I think there is a fear of disconnecting economic security, income security from from work because it's so important to people in terms of you know their, their their status their identity their sense of worth their sense of connection their sense of being part um, of of a community what would you say to reassure them around interventions such as guaranteed income um, that ultimately and it's not just in an immediate impact and we've seen some of the immediate impacts of stopped but in a longer term it won't lead to a gradual dis- detachment on, on this source of identity and dignity in in in, in life yeah I, and and I am probably not in agreement with a lot of people because I'm just not convinced that it's healthy for society for folks to derive their dignity and their meaning from what they do now, I think that does a disservice, particularly to folks who are differently abled, who aren't able to do traditional forms of work, et cetera. So, I mean, I guess I could entertain that conversation if we broaden the definition of work. So it's something that's more inclusive than the nine to five sort of rat race. And also part of it is just growing up working class. Like I love my job, but no one in my family loves their job. Like no one in my family finds their meaning in going to the job they don't like. Like, like I just I just know a lot of people who find their meaning in family, find their meaning in community, and find their meaning in contributing in some way. But oftentimes, that those are things they do outside of work. Um, because if you look at a lot of the jobs that people are, are are forced to take, I would argue that the folks have dignity, but these jobs don't. Jobs that don't pay a living wage, as Natalie mentioned, where you're working two jobs just to pay for a one bedroom apartment. Like that, 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 that is inherently undignified to me. So I guess for me, I am just more interested in kind of centric in conversation about what does it mean to be human and how do we make sure that if we believe in the inherent dignity of people that they're treated in dignified ways no matter where they are. But I would say that work is important, right? Like productivity is important. And I'm just really bullish and optimistic on people. Like I just, I have never met a person who just wants to sit at home all day. I have never met a person who just wants to not contribute. Um, and if I had met that person, they probably had some sort of like ailment. They probably maybe had a mental illness or something. Like, but I just, I've never met a person that's like, I just don't want to work. I don't want to do anything. No, people want to contribute. People want to be purpose- purposeful. People just want to be treated with dignity and people want to be, want their want the myth of American meritocracy to be true. That if I work hard, at least I could pay my bills. And right now in America, that's just not true. The people who work the hardest struggle the most, as Natalie mentioned, to pay for not boats to the Cayman Islands, not like even luxuries, not two houses, but two bedrooms, right? And I think that's so morally corrosive. And that's why I'm just very, very bullish on just saying, no, dignity is not attached to work. Dignity is attached to personhood. Thank you. Now, Natalie, how, how do you respond? I mean, some of the, some of the, if you like, those who are anxious around these, these sorts of 
um, interventions or, 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 or critical, are, are quite progressive voices um, in in many respects. And you know, I, I think Michael's response has has, has challenged them um, in 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 many respects. Uh, do 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 you feel that, that that is that how you would reach out into the debate? Do you think or um, would you would you look to reassure them more about the possible impact? I would say one that part of why you know we started the guaranteed income fight when we did, and you know I should say RSA was a big part of you know we read all the briefs you all put out back in the early days of economic security projects. We were watching what was happening in Switzerland. Like the European conversation influenced us in the United States because we need it more than you do. <laughs> we need a guaranteed income to support. But it was also after the conversation in the United States around wages was much more robust and mainstream. And that's no accident because wages have to rise in order for a guaranteed income to really be meaningful in people's lives. And I would argue we broke the link to, you know, to, to dignity coming from work when we moved into a become a low wage nation. We are predominantly a low wage service sector nation in the United States that pays minimum wage jobs and offers very little safety net. And there is very little dignity in that. You know, I, I spend a lot of time with United for Respect, which is one of um, the retail association uh, worker organizations. And one of the things they talk a lot about is respect. That, they, yeah, they don't define themselves by the work they do. That's not it. But they want respect at work. And the way they feel respect is, is through wages and through, you know, respect at, at the workplace. And so I think that the way we can show respect and support dignity is by giving people what they need, which is a living wage. And I think an income floor, a guaranteed income is, is part of that. So I'm 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 now playing the role of 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 a sort of progressive critic, if 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 you like. So so let's just, let's just go along with this. So I think I think the 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 response that might might come back would be, well, you know, isn't UBI or guaranteed income? We're just giving up here. You know, why don't we why don't we fight the good fight and actually try to back unions and living wages and give workers voice and power. Um, you know, uh, open out legislative support to, to, to workers um, in many different ways. Think about, a, a, you know, a job guarantee scheme, um, if if you like, you know, but make it a good job guarantee scheme with a, you know, a, a, a decent wage, you make a contribution and it has dignity, sure. dignity attached. What's, what, what's your response to me as the, as the you know, that, 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 that sort of different sort of progressive narrative? I would say, yes, let's do that. These two things we do not have to choose between. We do not have to say, this is the one thing we want. It's the only thing we can afford and we're going to go for it. No, no. We live in the richest nation on earth and we can have all of these things. We can support people with housing. Everyone could be guaranteed housing, guaranteed health care. Remember, we don't have that in the United States. We can guarantee non-labor income and we can guarantee a living wage through hourly work. We can do it all. We just have to decide we want to invest in the American society. And frankly, that's what's so exciting as a progressive right now to see that being reflected from the Biden administration uh, on down, this, this commitment to investing in way, bigger ways than we have in decades in society, in care infrastructure, in income supports, and in wages. Michael, what's your response to, the, to, to my sort of pushback? Let's make work better rather than giving up on it. I am. I'm, I'm, I think we have to do a lot of things at one time, right? So I, I absolutely agree. And I think Natalie made the point, the previous answer about sort of just given the fact that we're a low wage economy in America, the solution to that is higher wages <laughs> and, and a guaranteed income. And I think you use different tools to solve for different problems. Um, so I think that sort of there's a conversation around ra raising wages, raising the floor, 100% absolutely. There's a conversation about everyone who wants a job should have access to a job. Absolutely. And I think there's a conversation around sort of the abolition of poverty in the country, which I think guaranteed income is uniquely equipped to, to, to solve. But I, I don't think they're against each other. I think that they're, they're really sort of both different tools towards the same aim of how do we create a society that's more in line with sort of commonly held values in terms of the type of communities we want to live in. I would also say, I, I actually think a guaranteed income is a huge blessing 
to the labor movement. And I say that because I think uh, you mentioned Gene Sperling o- earlier, but this idea of economic dignity and having the agency to decide that once you have a reoccurring check, you're in a better position to bargain. You're in a better position to decide which types of jobs you take and which types of jobs you want. And I think a guaranteed income actually would help with fights around sort of unions and also fights around raising wages. Because if I'm getting $500 or $1,000 a month every month, that's something. And I could be a little bit more selective about do I really want to work for $7.25 an hour, right? Or do or are they going to have to raise the floor to compete with sort of this guarantee I'm getting? So I actually think they're very complementary and, and definitely both necessary. And yeah. unlike other provisions in the United States, when we don't tie it to work, it means there is no disincentive, right? People can go to work and continue to get the benefit and, and do both, have both things. And um, uh, so much of our existing That's safety cool. net is built differently. It's built uh, to, to, to as your income goes up, then you lose a whole set of benefits. Uh, and, and so I think that um, this is one of the, this is one of the reasons this is a progressive, should be a progressive part of a new social contract in the US. I think it's interesting, and, and I, obviously as a long-standing participant and observer of this discussion, um, you, you come, you, you hear a lot of the stuff over, you know, same stuff over and over again, and, and there are some really bad arguments against guaranteed income. It, it, it seems to me that have been disproven by experiments such as Stockton and many other things. You know, people are lazy; they'll they're, they're just going to spend it on the bad stuff, not the good stuff. You know, why should the rich get it? Um, when, you know, it's very easy to deal with that. You have a cut off or you, you tax them more. You know, it, it, not, none of these, these criticisms really seem to stick, but one or two really do seem to. And I'd just be interested to know which of the arguments of the, the opponents you think are, are strongest and how do you grapple with, with, with those? Michael, do you have any thoughts on that? I do think, I'm not sure the arguments are necessarily good faith or strong, but I do think a conversation around um, productivity and the types of activities we want to see people engage in, I think that's a good question, right? I think we know the answer, but I'm not, I wouldn't say that question is nonsensical. I think the question is, without a lot of thought on the surface, like, oh yeah, that's something curious, but when you actually think about it, you're like, oh no, actually people want to work. So I think that that has been, that, that question has really helped me think about sort of how do we talk about work? How do we, what do people, how, how are people motivated? And when we say work, what do we mean? Because I think oftentimes we use words and shorthand, but mean something else. Because I think when people talk about work, they're really talking about purpose, like reason, like why. And I think that's different and beyond the scope of work, but sort of that question really forced me to reckon with, okay, what are the words people are using and what are we trying to convey? And how do we, how do we answer that? Natalie, which are the arguments that, that keep you up at night from, from the, the, the opponents of these sorts of approaches? Well, I think we're seeing one play out right now. How, how, what, will, the, will giving people cash cause inflation? And this morning we woke up to the news that prices are up in the United States. And so I think this will be a big uh, testament. I think you'll see a lot of people um, pointing the arrows straight at the investments that Joe Biden has made and helping people put food on the table. And I think we'll have to grapple with how we handle that. You know, they're arguing, no, it's just a momentary price increase. Um, But that's the one that keeps me up at night right now, because the answer can't be that people don't eat, have enough to eat or pay rent or are kicked out of their houses. That can't be the answer. So let's figure out how um, we make the, you know, macroeconomics work and invest in families. Yeah. And the overall cost has got to be a big one, right? I mean, the, 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 there was just sort of a, a sort of slogan that caught on here from, from some of the, the, the um, uh, 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 opponents that it's either, you know, a universal basic income is either insufficient or unaffordable. Um, and, you know, it, it, you can do the modeling and you can show even at relatively low levels, it would make a big impact and big dent into sort of poverty and, and inequality with all the sort of advantages that you've you, you, you've outlined. But there's no doubt as you go towards, you know, the higher numbers that the price really does start to escalate, doesn't it? And that there is there would be choices at some point between, you know, different types of progressive um, investment or intervention and, and, and whether to build up a guaranteed income uh, or not. How 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 do you start to wrestle with some of the the, the, the cost 
and concerns that, that there may be. Michael. Yeah, I, I view the cost more as an investment in terms of sort of insure, you, you put some money in and you may not see an immediate return, but you know over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, you reap a massive return in terms of societal well-being, productivity, health outcomes, et cetera. And I also think that in, the, in America, we, we can deficit spend and that we have a long tradition of spending money on things that, that those in power think that matters. If you look at sort of our space force, our sort of multi-billion dollar um, technology used for space warfare, that, that, that we found a way to pay for it. And it was an expensive investment, but it was an investment that our decision makers thought was a good one. And I view kind of Garrett's thinking in the same, same way. Fascinating. Hi. I believe we can reject the frame of austerity politics that tells us we can't afford things in the United States. And, and that is the frame we have lived in for the past 50 years that say everything, you know, has to be as small as it can be that we can't uh, do big things with the United States, except as Mayor Tubbs points out, when we need to fight a war or, you know, when uh, we, we need to have a pet project of a president, uh, then we can find the money. And we are challenging right now the austerity politics in America and saying, no, we don't need to live like that. We can we can have progressive taxation and we can invest in families and make sure that the standard of living in America uh, is make supports people to live a dignified life. Uh, I, I really think the question is how can we afford not to? So we're, we, we're investing in, in the type of society that our kids or grandchildren want to be born into. Um, in, in, in it's, a, it's a link between generations in that, that, in that way. You know, where some of the Christians say it's actually about taking consumption now by borrowing from the, from the future. Actually, it's a linkage, isn't it, between different generations? Um, if you've done it in the right sort of way. Um, now, the Stockton um, impacts and, and, and outcomes um, were very positive um, for, for, for the participants um, in the ways um, Mayor Tubbs has outlined. Um, how scalable do you think it is, ultimately? Do you think you can get or replicate the effects of a small pilot into, into a larger scale, universal, national intervention? Well, we have about 50 mayors now who are trying out in their cities and we keep saying it, but we're just through the moon excited about this child tax credit. That's gonna be monthly, that's gonna be reoccurring, that we're fighting to make permanent, which will be a guaranteed income program at national scale. So I think we'll have a bunch of test cases to prove the same things. That A, people spend money how we spend money. B, that basic income helps people be better parents and neighbors and partners. And, and, and C, that we can trust people. We can trust regular hard work for Americans, just like we trust the very wealthy among us to make good decisions with, with, with money. Um, so I'm very excited over to see what the next couple of years play out. What's what's so interesting is in the US how it's become this sort of this this city plus grass grassroots upsurge that has 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 driven this. The same thing actually is, is is the case in the UK. It's been localities and individual representatives and communities that are making the demands. Our political system seems relatively impervious to it at the moment, but it's following a similar sort of sort of sort of course. Yeah, is is this the sort of, if you like, the big theory of change, Natalie? Yeah, we have a long history of progressive federalism in the U.S. and uh, for a long time, cities and states have served as the democ, you know, the laboratories of democracy. And I really want to underscore the work that Mayor Tubbs has done. You know, when he launched Mayor for a Guaranteed Income, we had dozens and then 30, and then 40, and then 50 mayors who've signed on representing some of the biggest cities in America. So you have Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms out of Atlanta, Mayor Eric Garcetti out of LA, just announced a $24 million pilot paid for through public 
dollars uh, in the city of LA that will that will demonstrate um, what a guaranteed income looks like in LA. Uh, there are small town mayors who are thinking about the rural implications where the dollar goes further, frankly, with a federal guaranteed income than it does in urban areas um, where I live. And so uh, this is a really, this, this means there's staying power, that this is not a moment. Uh, and it is not just the COVID context that is forcing this conversation, but it's something much bigger than that, which is the fact that even before COVID, our economy didn't work for most families. And the people who see that in their daily experience are mayors who are seeing people being kicked out of their homes in streets in their own city. And, and cities are... Uh, you know, have to have to budget very differently than the federal government does. So there's there's really nothing they, they can't create a guaranteed income. It really has to come, you know, from from the federal government. And so these mayors are saying we need one. And I'm going to demonstrate <clears throat> what it looks like in my city. <clears throat> and I just think this is going to be one of the most important political developments over the last year in the fight for a guaranteed income in the United States. Brilliant. Um, we're, we're running out of time, unfortunately. So I'm going I'm to I'm ask you a sort of final final question. Um, so, ten years time, where are we? Does a guaranteed income exist at the federal level? Or something that looks like it on the sort of not likely possibility probability spectrum. Where are we, Michael? Yeah, I mean, I, I like to move fast. So in, in the next decade, we have to have a guaranteed income policy. Um, that's my that's my North Star. That's my goal, working with folks like Natalie and others in the states to make it happen. But we're a lot closer today than I thought we would be in 2021. So I'm very, very optimistic about, about that. Now, in 10 years, can we be under a President Tubbs? Does your age work for that? I'll, I'll actually be old enough. Yeah, I'll be 40. <laughs> <laughs> so that's on, the, that's on the probability part of the spectrum, presumably. No, I mean, I don't, I, I lost re-election for for mayor, so it feels like I gotta. <laughs> it feels like I gotta review the fundamentals of po political campaigning. But for sure, this is guaranteed income is going to happen in ten years. I can, I will guarantee that. <laughs> you heard it here. Brilliant. That was a great conversation. I I, I think we could we could um, carry on, um, but unfortunately, we have run out of time. And. Um, for those who are watching, you'll, you'll find links to the, the SEED project, uh, Mayors for a Guaranteed Income and Economic Security project um, in the chat here and on the RSA uh, website. You'll also find links to the RSA's um, own reports on universal basic income, uh, the future of um, good work and economic security. Um, so do take a look on the website for that. Uh, I, I'm incredibly uh, grateful um, to, to Michael and Natalie uh, for joining it, joining us, being an incredibly rich and revealing conversation. Um, thank you for your time this afternoon, um, and do join us again soon. Thank, thank you, you so for much. having us.